happening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Convos with the Candidates. Our guest today, Speaker Therese Terlai and Minority Leader, Senator Frank Blas, Jr. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank right. you, Nestor. All right, so we had uh, like a little toss of the coin, and we decided that the speaker is going to introduce herself first. <laughs> Madam Speaker, please. Of a day, of course, I'm Therese Terlahi. Uh, it's been really a privilege and an honor of mine to serve as your senator, vice speaker, and speaker from the 34th to the 37th Guam legislatures. I'm asking for your support, your help again, to serve in the 38th Guam legislature. I feel that the people of Guam are facing some very tough challenges and we need people who are willing to work very hard, who are willing and will always tell you the truth, people who are willing to serve you in the manner that you deserve by addressing those issues that are very critical to you, such as the cost of living, such as crime, such as our schools, and very much uh, such as health care and housing. And um, I'd like to ask you for your support for me, again, to serve in the legislature and to bring in a whole, uh, and to help me not, in just, not just in this election, but also in the upcoming term by bringing in a whole 50, a set of 15 senators who are willing to do that hard work just as much. And again, I want to thank you for your trust and, um, and, and the privilege of serving you. And that together, I, I believe we have a lot of cause for hope, for good change for Guam, and that together we can do this. So again, thank you, and I, I appreciate your help and your trust for all these years. All right, Minority Leader, your well, introduction. Well, first off, let us start end to uh, Guam PDM. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, good afternoon, good morning, whenever you're watching this. My name is Frank Blas Jr. Uh, I'm currently the minority leader uh, in the 37th Guam Legislature. I'm humbled and thank you for this opportunity to serve you uh, in this legislature and I ask for your vote to continue to serve you in the 38th Guam Legislature. Um, I am going on my seventh term, or actually my seventh term I think, uh, in, in the legislature. Um, and I, I, I came back in actually after a four-year hiatus uh, because of what had been happening on our island with regard to our economy and uh, you know, the state of the island. Uh, our businesses continue to struggle. Our families struggle uh, every day with not just the, the high cost of living, but, but, but their worries with regards to health care, their worries with regard to how affordable homes, um, their worries about, with regard to crime. Um, in, in the 38th Guam Legislature, I want to be able to address not just those issues, but the issues of how are we, we going to continue to sustain ourselves and grow our economy. Our economy right now um, is, is basically, uh, and I'll term it, a, 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 a false economy in that it, a lot of the, the eggs are in, in, in one basket and we're neglecting the others and we're neglecting to build um, another basket uh, to, to build our economy. With your help and with your vote, uh, I will be able to continue to work on those issues. I, again, I enjoy working with the speaker um, and, and some of my other colleagues. Uh, I'm asking you for, for your vote uh, this coming election. My name is Frank Bloss, Jr. Thank you very much. All right, Speaker, so our format has been to allow the candidates an opportunity to talk about what they believe are their top issues and how they plan to address them. We'll take them one at a time. So, um, Madam Speaker, what is your top issue that you'd like to tackle in the 38th Guam Legislature? Um, I say I would very much like to continue the work that I've done for housing and uh, uh, in several areas. One is keeping the real property taxes down. Uh, I was able to pass that law in order that uh, real property taxes do not get raised for the next year despite for residences and agriculture lots despite the new assessment that's being done right now. Also through the Chamorro Land Trust to, they're just on the cusp of uh, issuing new leases, finally. It's taken a lot of work, and we've been able to, in addition to uh, you know, moving towards issuing new leases, to move legislation with the help of my colleagues to bring in infrastructure so that we can divide these lots up, particularly sewers, so we can divide these lots up into more lots and, and then more leases. And third is to, 
that we've um, just passed a law successfully, thanks to my colleagues again and their help. Uh, I was able to pass a law that would now clear up so many issues that the Chamorro Land Trust was facing and that those who, those thousands that have leases already were not able to build because of different errors by either, you know, the management team, the staff, or the, even the commissioners themselves in the past. And they're going to, if they are in compliance with the lease terms, we're going to be able to move those leases forward. Finally, they'll be able to get loans, they'll be able to get infrastructure, and they'll be able to build real houses in sanitary conditions. And I feel like all of that that's going to impact thousands of people. It's going to impact our housing market on Guam. All right, uh, Senator Blas, uh, what's your top issue and how you, would you specifically I guess my, address it? My top issue is going to be the economy. Uh, again, as I, I mentioned, you know, we, we're, we're, we've relied and we're relying on uh, right now an economy that is primarily fueled by the military buildup. Well, in a few years, that's going to end. And uh, when that ends, what is going to be at the, uh, the opposite side of that buildup? Um, you know, we've got a, a tourism market that is still flailing at, at, at around 50 percent. Um, we've got businesses that have not even opened, have uh, come back open uh, since the start of the pandemic. Um, we've got we, we've got to be able to entice businesses to, to again reopen the doors, entice new businesses to come on board. You know, bring jobs, uh, long-lasting jobs uh, and sustainable jobs uh, back into our economy. Because when, once that ends uh, and, and w w economy and the, our tourism is still the same way it is and we're not moving anything else in, the, in our economy, what is that going to mean for our island? Right now we're enjoying the fruits of that labor, that, that, the fruits of, 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 of that market, that, 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 tour, that military build-up market. What are we doing after that? You know, so another area that I want to be able to work on is obviously the state of our health care system. You know, I've taken the position on, uh, of, of before we even can discuss where our new hospital is going to be or, you know, what kind of a facility is going to be. Fix the system, fix the infrastructure that we have right now. You know, one of the discussions we're having on the floor right now is, is whether, you know, where, where public health is at as we stand. They're scattered all over the island. Um, you know, just to get the basic medical services that public health provides to the community. Forces individuals to have to, f to, to, to travel throughout the island just to get clearances and much less the services they need. Uh, this morning, right before I came here, I went to the Guam Fire Department. We only have five ambulances that are available for, for you know, for a population that, that, that we have. Optimally, or, or, or at least, you know, according to the firefighters, we need eight, okay? We have 15 in the fleet. Um, you know, where are we with that, and, and why do we continue to work that way? This has resulted in individuals who need medical transport to have to wait hours to be able to get, you know, from, from where they're at to an, to an emergency room. There is even one case where an individual who needed medical transport, but no ambulance is available. In fact, the fire department asked the individual to have somebody else transport that individual to the, to, to the hospital because of the medical attention they need. That's not what our people deserve, not especially now, especially when this governor claims that we've got so much money and we're taking care of all, all of this. If we are, we wouldn't be going into special session tomorrow uh, with regards to being able to take care of the hospital or m much less the cancer patients and the, and the ambulances. So I'd like to continue to make sure that we don't have these conversations anymore. As a matter of fact, we're looking at how we can be, make sure that we, the businesses continue to thrive, families continue to grow, people can get into homes, and if they get hurt, there's a hospital that they can go to that they're confident with. Okay, we've got two um, candidates here with the very uh, lengthy experiences for the floor speeches, so we're out of time for this particular half. We're gonna take a quick break and be back with uh, more of questions with the speaker and the minority leader right after this. with uh, Speaker Teresa Lai and Minority Leader Senator Frank Blas Jr. And uh, Speaker Lai, we've got a, a second issue that you want to tackle in the 38th. Yes, very similar to Senator Blas and uh, probably similar to the majority of people in Guam. It's the health care. My second priority is to continue what we've tried to do with health care, and that is bring this health care as it was intended to be out to the communities. We've done that through making sure we've got what they nicknamed uh, ER to your door. 
certified paramedics, making sure our licensing offices are working efficiently in order to license the nurses and the medical, uh, the, uh, all the medical professionals that we need here on Guam that we learned during COVID were critical to our care and our survival. And to make sure that um, uh, we empower our community, existing northern and southern community health centers to accomplish their full missions. These are all run by grants, federal grants. They're supposed to run as urgent care centers, uh, family care centers, maternal care centers, many services that they're supposed to be able to provide. We need to ensure that they, after COVID, get back to full service and that the closed central clinic that public health used to have is reopened because it's these community clinics where I believe the majority of our patients are going for this preventative care, particularly maternal and child, uh, child care. We've, the nurses who testified in our hearings were very clear that the services that they are being provided have drastically reduced due to the closure of that central facility. So we're pushing for that as well. I'd also, of course, we can't talk about healthcare without talking about our hospital. We all support a new hospital. There's no debate or disagreement on that. There's been, you know, a delay in following the law that we passed to put it into mooning, and they're probably going to recite that elsewhere, but we need a new hospital wherever it's going to be. And so, of course, we have done what the legislature does, that is the funding, that making sure that the authorities are there to proceed with a new hospital with uh, speed because we're on borrowed time at this point. But while we do that, it's critical that we make sure that GMH the roofs don't fall down on us and those elevators work and that the nursing staff is getting the benefits that they need in order to stay there because they've got great competition elsewhere and that uh, we are able to pay vendors so that we will have the supplies and the critical services that are being outsourced in our hospital. And that's not necessarily been the case over the past few years, but I, you know, um, through oversight hearings, through bills and laws that we've passed uh, we've been really trying to push gmh and to assist gmh and those who work there in getting these critical services to the people of guam ensuring that they stay in business while we focus on building a new hospital as well those two they have to be done together and i uh you know it takes all of us our entire community to do that work and that prioritization Senator Blas, another uh, top priority that you'd like to tackle in the 38th? Uh, well, I, I, I think that, you know, first off, <laughs> the government has got its basic responsibilities, and what we need to do is focus on those basic responsibilities. Anything outside of that is, is you know, if, if, if we can't meet those basic responsibilities, then everything else after that, it just impedes our, our progress. So, so again, it's, it's, it's looking at, uh, first off, how we're spending our money. You know, one of the things that I'm I'm, I'm going to I'm going to push for, and I'm going to push hard for now, is performance-based budgeting. You know, within 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 our government. You know, right now we're uh, granted that uh, we have moved, evolved into now a budget that pro basically provides them carte blanche. You know, when they come in and they decide that this is how much money we want. Well, I think the people of Guam, the taxpayers, deserve to know how their money is being spent, and whether or not there's any good progress. Uh, in 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 the efforts uh, to be able to provide the services. So what I want to think is what I want to push for is look, uh, uh, you're going to start with a, with with the zero dollars in your in your budget, and then you're going to justify why you want to be able to have so much money in there, and ensure that the people of Guam that you're, you're getting the services that the people of Guam rightly deserve. Again, the focus, the primary focus, is going to be towards our education. I mean, our our health. Uh, and our, our, our public our public safety, growing our economy, and and and, and then our education uh, as well. Uh, you know, uh, making sure that our kids are educated properly. But all of that comes back to again how the government spends its money. Our responsibility as legislators is to is to manage that those purse strings, 
And I think that it's high time based on even the audits but from the public auditor. You know, who have constantly, you know, I, I think that over the last year, two years, we've seen more negative audits, you know, on government operations than we have in, 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 basically in the, in, in the lifetime of, of, of government spending. And so we've got to be able to rein that in. One of the ways we're going to do this is, okay, now we're going to have to justify the money that you're going to be able to get. Okay. Yep. We can squeeze in one more each, but you got to keep it short, about a 60 seconds. Uh, you got a third uh, priority? Yeah, um, I think all of us, we run because we want to improve the quality of life of the people of Guam. For me, that's going, it has to right now, because of the challenges they're facing, address the cost of living. And we do this through keeping, the, lifting the fuel tax, which we did successfully, uh, ensuring that the real property taxes don't get raised, ensuring that we continue small business exemptions on gross receipts or BPT taxes. We extend the energy. We have extended that energy credit uh, in the past due to some hard work. And um, uh, I, you know, I, I think that's really been very helpful for, for households. Uh, bus passes, ID card fees for those who are in critical need so that they can reach the services that the government provides for them and are diversifying our economy because that's how we are getting these taxes and that's how we are going to attract businesses and sustain ourselves when tourism or other aspects of our economy are not as strong. And uh, in doing this, we've of course had to address the quality of life uh, resulting from high crime and put the money towards the canines so that we can stop the drugs from coming into Guam and we can put those stiffer penalties in for you know when they've been found guilty and that we can do these assessments that are necessary for those who are committing crime to see whether they are really safe to be released to the community. I think that's the hard work that we've been able to do. Right, 60 seconds, one last one. Well, you know, I started my, my professional career in the government as a police officer, as a matter of fact, I, I used to run the drug unit uh, you know, within the Guam Police Department, so I'm very familiar uh, you know, with, 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 with basically drug trafficking and drug use and stuff. And I, you know, we're, we're doing a dismal job with regards to how we're, how we're being able to deal with this issue, okay? We're not at war because if we were at war, we'd be fighting successfully. We, we, need, to, we, need, we need to bolster that. We need to be able to provide uh, ways that we can be able to deal with this. You know, when I, when, when I was back in commanding the drug unit, Ice back then was at about fifteen hundred dollars a gram. Today, ice you can get ice for about twenty-five dollars a gram, and it basically means one of two things: one, there's a pr pr proliferation of a number of users, and secondly, there's there's a lot of drugs out there. So we've got to have a holistic approach to this. You know, I've never thought that enforcement is is, is the dual end. No, it's got to be basically your your, your you know your recovery, um, your rehab, your your prevention, and your enforcement. You've got to be able to, 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 to bolster those areas. And so that's another area that I want to be able to, to, to look into. You know, we, we need to bring back those values and those, uh, you know, living on Guam uh, where it was, it, was, it was safe, it was comfortable, it, it, it was worth it. And, and that's what we want to bring. Let's, let's make, it, make it so that it's worth it. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Speaker, your uh, closing uh, remarks. All right, well, thank you, Nestor, and to Pacific Daily News. This is a great uh, opportunity to share again our message to the people of Guam. And I just really want to thank the people of Guam for their their trust. I mean, this is uh, something I really um, feel privileged to serve in this capacity and to gain your trust. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, you will share that uh, your help again in this upcoming election and in the upcoming term. And I believe that uh, with your help, we can get the legislature that the people of Guam deserve, a legislature that is focused on very hard work, not shirking from challenges, uh, that values your opinions and is able to hear you and respond to the challenges that you are facing. And a legislature that is not beholden to anyone else but the people of Guam, and that, I believe, is the power of the legislature if we put the right people in. It's they're going to be the voice of the legislature. They're going to fight for you and not fight for any other. And so, again, I want to thank you all for your support over these years and, and ask you very humbly for your support in this upcoming election, for your vote. Thank you, Speaker. Uh
Senator well, Moss. Say again, once again, thank you very much for this opportunity and for the people that are listening and watching. Thank you as well. You know, I want to start this by saying thank you, Madam Speaker, for advocating for a Republican majority. But that said, okay, is, um, you know, I, I, I would be humbled and, and gratified with a lot of gratitude uh, if you were to bring me back into the 38th Guam legislature. Uh, I came, like I said, after a four-year hiatus, I came back in because I didn't, I didn't appreciate, I didn't like the way uh, things were, were running and, and where we were going with regards to uh, how government services and how, uh, how our economy and how our way of life was being uh, disintegrated and deteriorating. And I want to be able to, to, to come back in so that we can help to boost and, and, and grow an economy that uh, you know our island and our people can thrive in. I want to be able to come back in and, and, and help and build a healthcare system that our people can rely on, an education system that, that our children will, will get the, the best education anywhere in the world, and, a, and an island and, a, and homes that are safe uh, from, from crime. I'd like to be able to, to, to continue to work on those things. And with your help uh, and your vote, uh, you know, I'll be able to do that in the 38th Guam Legislature. Again, I'm Frank Bloss, Jr. Thank you very much. All right. Minority Leader Senator Frank Bloss, Jr., Speaker Therese Terlahi, running for, once again for the uh, Guam Legislature. I'm Nestor Lecanto. Thanks for watching, everyone. We'll see you again next time on Convos with the Candidates.